Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable discussion on this very snowy day in Plainfield. And our lesson subject today is spirit. And we're so glad you all could join us. And we'll begin with our morning prayer. Reading from page 185 of Miscellany and 79 of Divinity Course in General Collectania. The peace of love is published and the sword of the spirit is drawn, nor will it be sheathed till truth shall reign triumphant over all the earth. Truth, life, and love are formidable wherever thought, felt, spoken, or written, in the pulpit, in the courtroom, by the wayside, or in our homes. They are the victors never to be vanquished. May all the allness of God, love, and the nothingness of art else serve to conquer the question of your protection and the allness of good and the powerlessness and non-existence of evil be the reality of your thought. The unseen silent forces of God are standing sentinel over me and mine and all silencing, destroying, and annihilating the unseen, silent arguments of the serpent material sense. All is mind, and mind is God, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient good. Mary Baker Eddy. Thank Beautiful. you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Watching point from 500 watching points. Watch number 160. Watch lest you accept the temptation to take the best of truth and use it in order to gain for yourself the best that matter or mortal mind has to offer. This would entirely reverse the purpose of Christian science, using it to turn spirit into matter instead of to dissipate matter in order that spirit may appear. Mrs. Eddy instructs us to resolve things into thoughts, not thoughts into things. End quote. Okay, thank you. Comments on that? I think this is really important because this is this new age movement that says you visualize things that you want and need, and this is exactly what this is addressing. Not, that's not what we're doing. Thank you very much. That's a good point. That, that, that's what New Age does. It tries to resolve thoughts into things. That's why we're very, we, we stay away from New Age. It's not Christian science. And, and many, and myself included, I'm sure, although I kind of came in, into it as a child, but people come seeking healing, seeking the loaves of fish and fishes. And um, we've talked about this before. And that's what we want. Uh, the health, the prosperity, the beautiful home, the big car, whatever else. But um, that's not the purpose of Christian science, is it? No. Yeah. That's interesting because I realized even with trying to get peace in my house or home or body, I was always trying to get peace without doing what I needed to do spiritually with the standing up to what was handling animal magnetism, uh, standing up for right and, and moral, dis, you know, stands. Mm -hmm. And so that I was trying to get peace without just, just clicking. Yeah, we're going to get into that peace, peace where there is no peace. So... What is the purpose of Christian science? To learn who we really are as God's child. Yes. To heal sin. It's to rid the yes. world of sin, disease, and death. Yeah. Sin comes first. Sin, yeah. She says it's to it's the spiritualization of thought. And we've talked about that. A lot of these other things do come as you learn more about God. They do come, but only as byproducts, not because that's the big aim. Hence, 
the quote from the Bible, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The things that you need, that is, or seem to need. Well, if you put it in the right order, I found everything that you need to do what you need to do that comes to you. And another thing I think is Miss Eddy says, whatever blesses one blesses all. And I, I've thought of that, but about that before, about how that also means if it doesn't bless all, then it can't really bless me, you know? Well, that's, that's it. Right. That's, a, that's right. If it's selfish, <laughs> it won't last. Parthens had once told me about this dream. It was more of a nightmare, actually, that he'd had. I wish I could. I wish he were here to tell it. He would do a better job than I am. But as I recall it, he was at a place where there were these bags and bags and bags, sort of like Santa Claus, you know, where the children have bags of requests, what what people want for Christmas. Only in this instance, it was. Christ Jesus receiving all these bags of what everybody wanted. And, um, it, you know, it was, <laughs> it was a very telling, but also sort of a jarring dream. Um, and so we learn here the truth of Christian science, what it really is. And you see so many Christian scientists have been so blessed in so many ways, with health and wealth. I mean, it's been known as a prosperity religion. It used to be known as that. At least that's what I'd heard. Also the armchair religion, because everybody sits and thinks. <laughs> <laughs> but many Christian scientists have become extremely wealthy. But again, that's not the goal, and that's not um, what, what are you going to do with all that wealth. And it, it's not... Definitely not necessarily an indication on whether you're a good practicing Christian scientist at all. It can just be, in fact, it could be the opposite. Especially if you get stuck in that materiality, that sense of materiality. And Mrs. Eddy did predict that Christian science would degenerate into materiality once she was no longer here. But I also feel that there's no bypassing the CQ first in, in order to feel secure, even with the things that you have. Because sometimes you may have things, um, but you are afraid to lose them or you holding on to them so much. This way you're losing your path spirit, spirit word. So I think, you know, this is the great uh, counsel to seek him first. And then whatever you have, you will have it. You cannot lose anything that you should have but you will have it with a foundation of spiritual understanding, which makes it, you feel more secure all over. Thank you, Florence. Wonderful point. There are so many so-called humanly, materially wealthy people in this world who are scared to death yeah. of losing it. They jump through hoops to protect it, they think. Yeah. They're very, very insecure, unhappy. I mean, it's proverbial, I guess, that all those things do not bring happiness. And really, what are we seeking? We are seeking what's in the responsive reading, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness and temperance. Yes. This, this should be what we're seeking. And also, the, as Florence said, it's the understanding of God. That is what we want. The material things, as I said, they're not what truly bring the happiness. What Gary was saying, they, they don't. And what Florence said, they're not what bring happiness. So, okay, Lillian, you read the golden text, please. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts. Yes. This is how all things good are ever achieved, by the Spirit of God. O only way, only way, anything is achieved. 
So yeah. as we discussed yesterday, if you want good, don't quench the spirit. <laughs> yeah, let it bloom and blossom. And don't try to brute force it or use willpower. <laughs> That's what I got out of that. Right. Right, That's which is right. not the spirit. That's not the spirit. It's the human. So, Karen, on the forum, you wrote about, you want to read that first verse and then tell us what you wrote about on the forum? Yes. Um, okay. That would be... <laughs> Uh, excuse me, I had it. <laughs> um, did you want me to? Okay, so the first for the responsive reading, I wrote um, what God has prepared. I said, um, excuse me. <laughs> okay. Uh, the quote, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Prepared, fitted, adapted, made ready, made suitable, provided, and then suitable, adequate, and both by Webster's uh, 1820 Dictionary. How wonderful is this promise that no matter where we are or what we're doing, we can be confident that God has fitted us, made us ready and adequate or equal to all that is required. He has provided this activity, whatever it is, <clears throat> not only to be blessed, but to bless and glorify God. So whatever doubts or fears about our ability to accomplish what is before us, this promise can relieve us of those doubts, and we can see exactly why God has brought us where we are. Thank you. Yes, that idea <clears throat> prepared, having everything we need. What a loving Father we have. Any other comments on that? And then, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things Yea, the deep things of God. That's how we know from the Spirit. As we had a good discussion yesterday about all of this. It's not material sense, but our spiritual sense. God is speaking. And then the next verse, Linda and Karen. Go ahead, Linda. Oh, the, what I, uh, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, is yes. what I wrote about. And then, um, from Webster's, okay. In Webster's, it says to, uh, to walk with God, to live in obedience to his commands. In scripture, to live and act or behave, to pursue a particular course of life, and to have communion with him. I love that, with God. To walk after the Spirit, to be guided by the counsels and influences of the Spirit, and by the Word of God, and to live a life of holy development. And I, that was the end of Webster's. I love the influences of the Spirit. But, um, and uh, this lesson was very beautiful. It just really gave you a sense of what it meant to it. What it meant to me daily demonstrating Christian Science was walking with God. I tried to translate it into something I can do practically. And so, yes, and this, I felt this lesson had so many things in it about what we needed to do. And that paints a beautiful picture. We should think of ourselves as walking with God. As we mentioned yesterday, Mr. Evans' favorite song, just a closer walk with him. That's uh, and walking, remember that saying, walking the walk, not talking the talk. Yeah. Living it, walking it, walking with the Father. <laughs> and I, I like what you said at the end. Each has his own place on the path and the same access to God's guidance, mm -hmm. dominion, and support. Same access, whatever path you're on. Everybody's got this access to the Father. How wonderful is that? No one deprived of it. Just haven't tapped into it, perhaps, but it's there. It doesn't matter where you live, what your background is, anything. It's yours. It's yours. Audience, 
with spirit, Mrs. Eddy says, prayer. And Karen, your quote from True Vision. I love True Vision by John Morgan. Yeah. <clears throat> I've been reading along with each synonym each week. I've been reading what he has to say about each synonym. So yeah. this week's was spirit. And he, I just took a, a few of the ones that he commented from spirit. He says, with regard to the synonym spirit, through spirit, I see all things rightly, clearly, correctly, distinctly, spiritually. This gives me discernment so that I can differentiate between one idea and another, also between true and false. The clear sight of spirit does not blind me to faults and errors. Rather, I detect them more clearly, but as unrealities. I discern only the good and the true to be real, and so my eye is single. It is spirit that does the seeing, not flesh, and the senses of spirit are indestructible and perfect. My outlook is always positive, never negative, because my vision is spiritual. So I thought that was definitely being present with the Lord and walking in the spirit. Yes. Yeah. It's something I do work with often, true vision. And, and those of you, I mean, it, it has, certainly has to do with vision, but it has to do with everything and a, an expansion on the synonyms and how to use them. And it's so, so wonderful and instructive to work with those. Thank you. And then, go ahead, Florence, please. So this is so important, the, the outlook or the view, because it's always only the view, right? How we see things is what makes it <laughs> persist as negative or not. So I think it's a good point there. Yeah, you know, that, that's, that, I'm glad you pointed that out, Florence, because it's, uh, you know, whenever we have a problem that needs to be healed, it's our vision that needs to be cleared. It's our vision that needs to be corrected. So, yes, it, our vision is what always needs to be cleared. We have to see through. We see through what the lens darkly, but we have to see through it in, in its right light. Get the right viewpoint. And, and yes, so that's another indication when you're in the wrong mind, when you get negative, when everything seems bad and terrible and the world is coming to an end, that means you're not in the right mind. Isn't that, that's what John Morgan said. <laughs> that's what Mrs. Eddy says too. Have your vision positive, seeing what's really going on, the truth, what's behind what it is we're seeming to see, what truth is actually there operating. I was in the prayer this morning too. And remember that it is truth that's always the victor. We can be knowing that truth is truth will arise and be victorious and lies cannot stand or operate they're powerless as long as we're willing to seek the truth yes it was interesting because Carthens gave me this interesting quote this week there is a principle which is a bar against all information which is proof against all arguments and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is condemnation prior to investigation. And it's by a William Paley. Now, we know that that is not a principle of God. That's a human principle. But it, it, isn't this what they tried to do to Mrs. Eddy in the next friend's suit? They tried to condemn her. They tried to do everything they could to destroy her and her reputation so that people wouldn't even be interested in Christian science at all. So they wouldn't have the investigation, right? And this is going on today where people get pounced on and condemned and they're often the mouthpiece of truth. And they, they, get, they, they put before you this horrible array of how awful these people are or person is so that you don't even listen to what they might have to say. You just take for granted what everyone is saying about them, all the condemnation of them. This is where you must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And uh, anyway, I thought it was interesting that 
quote. Uh, this is this is a practice that is practiced by so-called human mind, right? That is acting out of fear, acting out of ignorance itself, but mostly out of fear, because it it sees the world as material, as finite, as temporary, and it wants to hang on to what it materially has as long as it can, and so it pounces on the truth and the and the mouthpiece certainly they did that to christ jesus christ jesus saw it every day he, yes and mrs eddie saw it most days yeah and people people today are seeing the same thing happen to them so even though they both made themselves of no reputation that's it but you see the truth prevailed eventually it and even at that time it was prevailing um, and it always will. T Truth with a capital T. It always will. It might seem to be hidden from the people for a while, but it will prevail. It has to, because it's truth. And this is the leaven of truth. It's working and operating. And this is Eddie's science and health. Getting it out to the world is accomplishing this. It has to be the victor. So... That so-called principle is no principle. It's just a human attempt to hide the truth. Now, the next part of the um, responsive reading, I'm going to read a few verses that aren't in it, but it's in Galatians 5. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. You see, this is what goes on. They... It can't coexist. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanly, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, lasciviousness. lasciviousness. <laughs> adultery, witchcraft, Hatred, variance, emulations, emulations, <laughs> emulations, thank you. Wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Now, we don't usually put in about the works of the flesh because we don't need to read those every day. <laughs> but every once in a while, it's good to bring out that, um, what they are, to make sure we're not drifting into any of those things. Uh, but one of the most important things I've learned, and I, I know we've talked about this before, but it's the idea that the fruit fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. I used to think that I had to try to be loving, joyful, peaceful, long-suffering, gentle, good, faithful, meek, and temperate. Something I had to try to do. So what is, what is the difference when you're realizing it's the fruit of the Spirit? Well, it's not an emulation. You're not, <laughs> you're not pretending. You, you, you're not the source of it. Thank you. It comes. Yes. You don't have to try to be good. You have to be what God made, and you will be good. You yes. have to obey God, and you will be good. It is a result of living a spirit-filled life. It comes. It's not something that you try to do. I don't know why it took me so long to understand or figure that out, but it really did. It's like the lawyer that approached Jesus and said, Oh, good master. <laughs> And Jesus rebuked him, right? Uh -huh. 
Why callest thou me good? There is none good but God. And that's true of all of it. Oh, oh loving master, or oh, oh, joyful, peaceful, long-suffering. That story I told you, Mrs. Eddy, when people came to her and told her how good she was, she said, don't, don't call me good the same way mm -hmm. that Jesus did. I'm not good. If I'm good, it's because I'm, I'm just reflecting God's goodness. This gets rid of all this sense of, of pride and, and a, a selfhood apart from God. And it also goes, and these are some of my favorite verses in the Bible, John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, and shall be my disciples. And, and whenever Jesus gave a sermon like this, to his, or instruction like this, and referred to himself... What did what was he referring to? God, God, the Father, the Christ, the Christ. Okay. He was referring to the Christ that was in him. He was not referring to the person Jesus. This is where so many so-called Christians get screwed up. They think he was referring to him as a person. He was not referring to him as a person. He was referring to the Christ that was his life as the son of God, as the image and likeness of God. And this Christ is, is dwells within all of us. This Christ, the and Christ mind. Let this mind be also in you, which was also what? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. So remember, the branches aren't designed to produce fruit. Okay? Remember this. You are not designed to produce fruit. Got that? <laughs> without this Christ, without the God Spirit, the Spirit of God dwelling in you, you can do nothing. Remember I just read that? Sippo, zero, can't heal a flea. <laughs> okay? Can't do any good thing. Only, only as you abide in him and he abides in you. It's like the sap that comes down from the vine to the branches. I, I think um, here again, you know, this thing, of, and I think I did it. That's why it took me so long. But we, we are learning the scientific statement of being. I think Mrs. Eddy gave it so we all can, when we start to study science, to know that we are not of ourselves. I think for years I was just I just didn't make that connection of always knowing that I am of God, reflecting God, manifesting God, representation, all the others. And I I see now that if that thought was very clear to me, then I would you know as I try to live these things, they will out picture naturally, and. I also was reading something about this I, that we always say, I am this, oh, I can't do it, oh, I'm so confused. When we give some thought to the I that we're talking about, if we are knowing that we are not of ourselves, then when we say I, we are careful what we say after that. Um, oh, I'm sick, oh, I'm this, all the negatives that go with the I. We're really defiling the infinite eye, which we all are included in. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. because when you, yeah, when, when I declare that I am wrong, bad, sick, 
or a lot of people say I can't I can't heal myself why can't I heal myself and I always say well that's true you can't <laughs> don't even bother to try you cannot but God can but that is the personal selfhood apart from God that says I can't I'm sick I'm depressed and then you orbit around in your own personal selfhood and you've lost your oneness with the father and it was interesting, too, someone pointed out that Paul contrasts the works of the flesh with the fruits of the spirit. <laughs> okay, so the works of the flesh, you're, you are in your orbit by yourself doing all those things. It has nothing to do with God, but the fruits of the spirit, the results of abiding in God. And what does it mean to abide Have the one consciousness of your unity with God. Yes. Just dwelling, living. Well, what does Citation 11 in the Science and Health tell us that it is? To be present with the Lord is what? Absent in the body. Thank you. Yes. It is to be in obedience to the law of God. That's what it means to abide with him. Thank you. To be absolutely governed by divine love. That's what it means. That's what Jesus did. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it, it is. It is. And this is Eddie. Bless her heart. She, she makes it so clear. To be obedient to the law, the laws of God, the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, the laws, the commandments that God has and that Christ Jesus has given to us. And then to be governed by divine love, not by irritation and hate or envy, but by divine love. The sweet amenities of love in the rule for motors and acts. And what are the sweet amenities of love? Brotherliness. Rebuking. Brotherliness. Rebuking sin is the first one. <laughs> Don't forget the first one. Brotherliness, charitableness, forgiveness. Brotherliness. And, and forgiveness. And forgiveness. Those are the sweet amenities. And that's why we work with the rule for modus and acts. So we're not um, being governed by personal sense, mere personal attachment. Or what's the other one? Animosity. Animosity. Thank you. Animosity. That's the irritation. So, and, and this is why the three daily duties are so important, because this is how you do abide in, in God, living it. And she says in that statement in Science and Health, too, it's not just um, mere emotional ecstasy or faith. And then the actual demonstration and understanding of life is revealed in Christian science. So we're demonstrating. We're, we're doing it. We're living it. And then this, and I, I gave this to several people this week, but, and I know Florence has read in our prayers on Sunday sometimes from the Blue Book, Mrs. Eddy talks about abiding in that 91st Psalm. That's why it is so important to memorize it, to know what's in there, to live it, all the wonderful things God is doing for you as you abide in him abiding in him and then the end that usually it just brings me to tears but th and this is actually i pray this all the time i pray it for myself but i also pray it for all of you because i know all of you work the very best you know how to live the precepts of our dear master as the hymn says and because of that and this is what it says and I'm going to read it as if God were talking to you. Because you have set your love upon me. Therefore will I deliver you. I will set you on high. 
because you have known my name. You shall call upon me, and I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver you and honor you. With long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. I don't know of anything more beautiful than that. That is what God is telling you. What is left out of there? Nothing. That is what God does for us when we abide in him. Delivers us. He sets us on high. He honors us. With a long life, he will show you his salvation. It's just, um, I don't know, beyond words to me. It's so beautiful. So it says it all. And this is where we must abide and live. And this is the spirit, having a spirit-filled life, as they call it, with God living in us and through us. Now, switch gears a bit. <clears throat> I'm going to speak about what Parthens wrote on the forum. I had asked him to write it because he was sending me these things, and I, I thought it was about drugs. Because recently I had seen something. I hadn't, didn't watch all of it. I just watched actually just a little bit of it, but it was about Hitler and drugs. And how Hitler every day, his doctor, pumped him up with all kinds of drugs. And how in the army, in the, you know, World War II, his soldiers were all pumped up with drugs. It was why they could uh, march and never sleep, work for days. It's also why they could commit the atrocities that were done at that time. Because people always ask, I ask, how would anybody do that? Well, they weren't in their right minds. Somewhere along the way, it was in many places, you know, as a child, certainly my mother and father talk about not taking drugs. I remember in school watching a horrific movie about drug taking, you know, heroin and other things, scared the bejesus out of me. And then also in Sunday school was simply explain you don't want to take drugs because the greatest thing you have is your ability to think with God. Why would you want to mess with that? All those things greatly impressed me. But in today's society, where big pharma is so big and seems to be getting bigger, and I'm addressing this now because of a lot of people are asking me about vaccines. We, of course, we take no official position on anything in our church. Everybody is got to work things out to the best of their own understanding. But I thought it was interesting, Parthen's writing the original origin of those words, pharma. And it was drugs or spells, magic, sorcery, enchantment. And he quoted it first, and this was from Science and Health. I think this is one of Gary's favorite statements in Science and Health. The ancient Christians were healers. Why has this element of Christianity been lost? Because our systems of religion are governed more or less by our systems of medicines. The first idolatry was faith in matter. The schools have rendered faith in drugs the fashion rather than faith in deity. By trusting matter to destroy its own discord, health and harmony have been sacrificed. Such systems are barren of the vitality of spiritual power, by which material sense is made the servant of science, and religion becomes Christ-like. So, can't we just thank Mrs. Eddy for giving us the science? which teaches us this. And she says in her other writings, that if, if, vac if, if it were true that vac vaccines 
could help us, we'd all be dead. <laughs> she said that. <laughs> well, she uh, that, that's that's a paraphrase. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but but we know that it's it's that that they're of no help. However, if they're required by law, we do what the law says, and we know that we cannot be harmed by obeying the law. That's a paraphrase. Well, and that comes from the Red Book, three pages in the Red Book, which is Essays and Other Footprints. It's another one of book, another one of the Richard Oaks books. And on page 62 and, and 63, she says this, Truth is the absolute intermediate and ultimate of all things. To attempt this absolute demonstration of truth in its intermediate stage is to delay its ultimatum in the minds of men. Hence, the impracticality of undertaking to prove the entire power of the infinite to finite thought. And before your own thought has grasped all that is practical and demonstrated what you know is true of the divine principle with governs, which governs. In metaphysics, we learn that the majority of mortal opinions outweigh the minority. Therefore, a wise, honest, and skillful metaphysician casts not pearls before those that trample upon them. Then she says, in the case of the amputation of a limb or even a surgical operation of less severity, the following Christian science, the follower of Christian science, according to Christ, calcul calculates on going to war with 10,000 against 20,000. 99,000 mortals believe that human beings without the use of anesthetics suffer intensely from surgical operations. Also, they believe as certainly that the use of chloroform or ether can prevent this suffering. Here is an instance where surgery is sought for the amputation of a limb. Suppose the patient is a Christian scientist. He knows that a vast majority of mortals believe and that the surgeon himself believes that this operation will give his patient severe suffering unless ether is administered. This illustri illustrates that saying of our great exemplar, war not with 10,000 against 20,000. I used to wonder what that meant. So then she goes on to, to talk about that. But she says, rather than quarrel over being vac vaccinated, I recommend that if the law demand an individual to submit to this proce process, he obey the law and then appeal to the gospel to save him from any bad results. Whatever change belongs to this century or this epoch, we may safely submit to the providence of God to common justice, individual rights, and governmental usages. So, if at all possible, we run like hell from drugs, all right? <laughs> I mean, we do. And we abide in the 91st Psalm and know that is our Savior and our protection. It never comes from drugs. Mm. It's possible. So, without a doubt... But if for some reason you have to or someone you love has to, then you do what she says here. And, and I call it defanging. It can't hurt. And I don't know what good it is to read about all the effects of some drug you have to take. If you have to take it, then no, it can only bless you. But that's only if you have to. If, if it becomes a law, I pray to God it does not. But right now it is not. But then there are people who seem to have to take it because of maybe because of traveling or, or whatever. So that is from Mrs. Eddy. And I don't know what more to say than that. I, and if you all want to say anything more, say it. But we as scientists do not think drug is the savior uh, or pharmaceutical. I thought it was very interesting, the original source of those words. 
not good. <laughs> not good. So I think it's our own loyalty to God and what we are learning and some of the examples we've had where where science heals and many there are many. So it's it's really up to your thinking, I feel. I mean, even if you have to take something, what is in my thought to me is what's important. That's it. If if you're not if you're not seeing it as your savior, and, and you know, suffer it so to be now, at, at this point. And the less you think of it, the better. But for the most part, we do avoid it. We don't want to go there, um, and we know why we don't. Well, and, there are several things. I'm sorry, Mary. No, please go ahead. Well, there are several things that come to my mind. Nothing inharmonious can enter being. So if someone is taking it for whatever reason, it can't hurt you. And Mrs. Eddy also says matter can afford you no aid. So those two things right there say it all to me. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. That's it. So we, we work... Um, in this way and these are troubled water times we're going through and that's why I tell you all to stay in the ark of Christian science stay in the ark don't go out know the truth abide abide in the 91st Psalm and God is our Savior that's all that I just read to you he'll be with you in trouble he will do all those things and but don't be afraid of anything because it's never good to be afraid of anything and we can always be knowing the truth where is our thought and if you have to do something you have to do it the less you think about it the better I know as a child eventually I mean I think I had polio vaccines and other things it's just what I had to do I remember getting them in school I didn't think too much about it so um, do what you have to do but as Christian scientists it's certainly not something we're promoting uh, none of this because we know where our help comes from it comes from God and God alone and I like you all Gary's going to read it at the ending watch his prayers and arguments in my book it's page 104 and 105 it's about Materia Medica what Mrs. Eddy says about it we've had it parts of it before in our watch but this is the truth of this whole thing this is how we all should be working daily Again, to bring in the millennium. This is our opportunity now, instead of everybody turning to vaccines and drugs as their savior, to say, no, 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 no. That's not what's going to happen. Everybody's going to turn to God as their savior and realize God is the answer. And God is our great physician. And he's the one we turn to in um, trouble for help. That's what we're working. We're working on that. And let's work all the more diligently to bring this about because truly that will bring usher in the millennium as well this is another way we're doing it and let science and health go out and do its healing work for everyone everywhere and this is the activity of spirit and it's a great activity so I had also on page 283 it might be the same thing but he say some things about Materia Medica also, which follows the the 282 where God is all, there is no evil. Right the next page, she says some beautiful things about Materia Medica. It might be the same thing. I'm not sure. This is from the Blue Book. Oh, from the Blue book. Well, okay. okay, good. Well, that that's good. This Yeah, maybe, because sometimes there's overlapping. So mm -hmm. Carrie will end with this materia medica. Does anyone else want to say anything or ask any questions? I know this is a very hot. Yes, May I make a comment? Sure. I'd like to share from Science and Health with key to the scriptures, page 144, number 27. This meant a great deal to me, and it seemed to touch on uh, what uh, was said uh, just a while ago. I'm going to give the quote. When the science of being is universally understood, every man will be his own physician and truth will be the universal panacea. Thank you. That's beautiful. And that's exactly right. 
And that's what we're working for. Absolutely we are. So keep at it. Have the healings every day. Live that spirit-filled life. Abide in the 91st Psalm. And get for the world. Pardon me. Yes. For Pray all for the, uh, everyone that they might know the truth. That's it. Absolutely. The leaven of truth working everywhere, awakening all peoples. And, and let your... And your, let, let, let your life be a testimony to everyone around you. Yes. Okay, Gary's going to conclude now. We're From Watts' Prayers and Arguments, Materia Medica. There is no power, intelligence, or principle, mesmeric or hypnotic, in Materia Medica, as individual or collective mind. Therefore, it cannot blind nor hypnotize mortals through human beliefs or willpower from seeking the true healing as it is in Christ Jesus and Christian science. There is but one physician, because there is but one mind, whose medicine is truth, which destroys all error, whose attraction is love, which casteth out all fear. This is the one mind which was also in Christ Jesus, and this mind alone can draw all men unto him, divine love. Materia Medica cannot hide under the guise of hygiene, witchcraft, magic, spiritualism, mind cure, faith cure, or any other subtle form of carnality. For to be carnally minded is death. Man, I, cannot be bewitched or mesmerized by alluring or high-sounding phrases or methods nor by any personality, individual or collective, which substitutes matter and materia medica for the healing power of truth, Christ. The nothingness and impotence of materia medica is demonstrated through divine science by its loyal students who reflect divine intelligence, which destroys any claim of intelligence not in God, good, divine mind. To enmity's own hell of ignorance, superstition, hypocrisy, and hatred, justice consigns the law which would slay man in order to satisfy its own beliefs in materia medica and false theology. God made man immortal and in his image, the image of his own eternity, and to this end gave him dominion over all the earth, over all the works of his hands. This is the truth of being, and nothing can change the truth into a lie. Nothing can wrest man out of the Father's hand, for it is he who hath made us, and not we ourselves, and hath given us life everlasting. Therefore, health Harmony and immortality are the everlasting facts of being. It is so. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.